Howdy, everyone. Uh, welcome back for the last uh, uh, main panel this afternoon. Uh, my name is Emily Sellers. I'm a faculty member here at the Bush School, and I'm really happy to have the opportunity to present uh, this uh, incredible panel on new research on women, peace, and security. I'm going to make my introductory remarks very, very brief to leave plenty of time for the panel speakers, uh, given especially that we're running a bit behind this afternoon. And we have uh, an incredible lineup of women who are doing some really cutting edge and high level research on this topic. Um, so I'm going to sort of go in order uh, as those in the program, and then I'll pass it over to the first presenter. Um, so the first speaker we have this afternoon is uh, Natalie Ganella Platz, who is the deputy director of the Women's Initiative at the George W. Bush Institute in Dallas. She is responsible for numerous programmatic and research efforts at the Institute related to women, peace, and security, including the First Ladies Initiative, the Afghan Women's Project, and the Women's Initiative Fellowship. And really happy to have her with us today to share some of her ongoing research on, this, uh, on these topics. Uh, next in the list is uh, uh, the Bush School's own Dr. Valerie Hudson, who uh, holds the George H.W. Bush Chair. Uh, she's a leading scholar, as most of us in the room know, on women, peace, and security in the world, in addition to other topics. And she's published numerous articles and books. Uh, and her most recent uh, is the um, one people talk about a lot, which is the Hillary Doctrine, How Sex Came to Matter in American Foreign Policy. Uh, she's been recognized by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential global uh, thinkers. And we're really privileged to have her here on the faculty and with us today to share some of her ongoing work. Uh, the next speaker on the panel is Dr. Ellen Herring, who is the Director of Programs and Research at the Service Women's Action Network in Washington, D.C. Uh, she's a senior fellow at the Women's uh, Women in National Security as well, where she directs the Combat Integration Initiative. We're pleased to have her with us today to discuss some of her ongoing work on women and gender in the military. Uh, the final speaker, actually the first speaker to go and the final speaker list in the program is Dr. Sabrina Karim, who is an Assistant Professor of Government at Cornell University and an emerging scholar on conflict and peace processes. Uh, Dr. Karim's work focuses on several topics related to women, peace, and security, including work on state building after civil war, on gender reforms and peacekeeping and domestic security issues, uh, on relationship between gender and violence more broadly as well. Uh, her first book, Equal Opportunity Peacekeeping, received the Conflict Research Society's Best Book Prize this year. Uh, we're really happy to have her with us today. Uh, the moderator for the panel is the Bush School's own Dr. Leslie Rule, who is the Assistant Director at the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs. She is a conservation ecologist by training, uh, and she's worked on projects related to conservation, development, and conflict in over 65 countries in the world. Her work has been recognized with the UN's Equator Prize Initiative and the Dean's Award for Interdisciplinary uh, 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 Teams here at Texas A&M. She's also the instructor of the graduate class in Women, International Development, and Environmental Conflict here at the Bush School, and we're thrilled to have her on staff at the Bush School now. Um, so without taking any more time, I'm going to pass it over to the first uh, speaker, Dr. Sabrina Kareem of Cornell. How do I get this on the screen? Oh, it's being done for me. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thank you for uh, staying for this last panel. Um, and a special thank you to Valerie um, and the Texas A&M team here at the Bush School for inviting me and um, <laughs> for having the panel on research. It's, it's a little difficult when you're a short person. <laughs> for it to stay. I might, just, uh, I might just actually talk out loud if, if this doesn't work. Um, so. We've been asked to talk about new research that's ongoing um, on this agenda. And I just wanted to start out um, by, uh, I guess, telling you a little bit about what's now considered maybe old news or old research, because um, there is a, a book out about it. Um, and this book, Equal Opportunity Peace, e Equal Opportunity Peacekeeping, um, came about just because of the dearth of research on gender and peacekeeping. Um, and so this is kind of one of the first books that, that takes a comprehensive understanding of what it means for women to be in peacekeeping missions, the experiences that they have, as well as a number of problems that they encounter uh, while they're in mission. And I just wanted to highlight a few key points from the book um, that I think might spur future research, hopefully, on this topic as well. First being um, that we've talked a lot and we've heard a lot about the importance of having more women in peacekeeping missions. But that's just the beginning, right? One of the findings in the book is actually that female peacekeepers end up going to the safest missions and not necessarily ones to where they're the most needed. So they're going to places like Cyprus and not the DRC. And so this is a problem because if we think that women are helpful, right, as we know that they are, in a lot of problem solving that's going on in conflict countries, we're not sending female peacekeepers to the right place. 
we're sending them to the safest missions because of a, 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 a protection norm, right? We still have this idea that even if women are in the military, um, they somehow still need to be protected. So this is one of the, the main points in the book. A second point um, has to do with sexual exploitation and abuse, as we all know is a problem in peacekeeping missions. And interestingly, and, and um, actually, it's, it's, it's actually a very nice thing to say here, which is that um, under the Bush administration in 2007, um, the conduct and discipline unit in uh, peacekeeping missions actually um, came about. All right, uh, we didn't have a conduct and discipline unit in the United Nations um, until 2007. And so we kind of trace this history of the evolution of policy around sexual exploitation and abuse um, and find that when we have higher quality of peacekeepers right, from countries that, are, that have better rates of gender equality, that we actually have fewer incidents of sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, and that's maybe a no-brainer to, to those of you in the audience here. Um, but it's something to think about is that it's the quality of those peacekeeping uh, units that matter on the ground if we're going to s s uh, prevent this kind of abuse from happening. Um, and the last part of the book talks about the legacy of peacekeeping missions on gender equality in the host country. So what kind of legacy are female peacekeepers leaving? Are they inspirational to women on the ground? Are they inspirational to police officers? Um, to, to females who want to be police officers, to females who want to join the military, et cetera. So, so this is, that's, that's kind of where I leave off, and I'm going to hand it over to other researchers um, to take the to, uh, research and move it forward on this. But I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what I am working on right now. And there's three points. Um, one is kind of thinking about this idea of gender equality and disaggregating it, especially when it comes to thinking about how we measure outcomes and what we mean by success. Second, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, post-conflict sexual violence because a lot of research has been done on wartime sexual violence. In fact, we have six or so UN Security Council resolutions on wartime sexual violence, um, but we know very little about what happens after a conflict ends. And thirdly, uh, just very briefly on this idea of male backlash, which is something that we've heard about a few times already today. Um, but something that um, maybe globally is becoming a, a more alarming trend. Um, so firstly, disaggregating this concept of gender equality. When we think of gender equality, right, what do we think of? There's so many different components that go into gender equality. right? So I kind of thought about four different ways we could think about this. The first being women's inclusion. And that means putting female bodies in spaces that have traditionally been masculine. So putting more women into the police force, putting more women into politics, politics putting more women into the military, right? increasing that ratio. That's important. But that is different from women's institutional rights, which is about passing laws and regulations that affect women in country. Right? We're, we're, we're talking specifically about rights, legal rights, enshrined in constitutions, enshrined in law. That's different than women's vulnerabilities, which is about institutional or structural issues that affect women's health, that affect women's, um, you know, everything from maternal mortality rates to violence against women. It's the structural issue that matters, right? And that is different from societal beliefs about women. Right? This, is a, this last point is, is somewhat cultural. We can't necessarily inform um, or change cultures if we don't change beliefs. The important thing about this, this distinction is that they are not highly correlated, which means they're not related to one another. So in places where you might have high inclusion, you might not have high institutional rights. And I just, being the kind of social scientist that I am, I wanted to show you this in graphical form, um, which is basically indicators um, of political inclusion on the top here, which if we were to look across is different from social inclusion, which is different from economic inclusion. It, it gives a score over time. And you can see that the trends are very different depending on what we're measuring. And that's important because if we are just measuring one of these indicators, then we're missing these other indicators that are also important when we're moving forward. Now Valerie has done a fantastic job through the Women's Stats program, which I'm sure she's gonna talk about, in terms of thinking about measurement. There's so many different indicators that the Women's Stats Project has 
um, that has been incredibly valuable in thinking about this problem. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, so let me move on to the second point, which is about post-conflict sexual violence. Here, um, we know that there is a lot of variation um, in wartime sexual violence. So some conflicts, like El Salvador, back in the day in the 1990s, had very low rates of sexual violence. But other conflicts, like Bosnia or Rwanda, had very high rates of sexual violence. And so we've, we've actually uncovered a lot of research recently that kind of explains why we see this variation. But what we haven't done is thought about what happens after a conflict ends. Do rates of sexual violence stay the same? Do they increase? Do they decrease? And that's uh, a body of research that I have just started over the last two or, three, two or three years in Liberia looking at whether or not legacies of conflict affect post-conflict levels of sexual violence. And one of the main findings from that research is actually the number one perpetrator in the post-conflict era are neighbors. And you can think of that actually as a legacy of conflict, not directly. Right? We're not talking about soldiers or uh, combatants that are engaging in sexual violence. We're talking about neighbors, but neighborhoods in a post-conflict country have become less stable. Right? You can think back before the war, they were much closer knit. Right? People knew who their neighbors were. People knew who the community leaders were. There was a relationship and a trust there and one could think that maybe the conflict disrupted that, especially because you have people coming in and out of communities now. They're more transitory. And so it's possible that that is a legacy of conflict that has affected the levels of post-conflict sexual violence. Uh, and that is one of the um, things that my research has uncovered. Another point here is to think about data collection of sexual violence. So I've been working with the health clinics in Monrovia, Liberia, for the last three years on collecting data. And unfortunately, one of the, um, I mean, unfortunately, but interestingly, now that we know this, it's, it's important for, for delivering services. Um, the majority and over 80% of those that are using the health services are minors. Right. So they have one-stop centers with health clinics, and the only people really that are using those are minors that are experiencing se sexual violence, which means that adult women, for some reason, are not using the services that are being provided by the state. And that has only been uncovered recently over the last um, year through this research of data collection with uh, partnering with this, these health clinics. Another thing that was uncovered here was a disparity of about 700 cases per year that were not being reported to the police. Right, so there's a gap between the healthcare facility and um, the police. I've also been doing some work with perpetrators to try to understand if um, the perpetrator, the, you know, if there's a difference in thinking among ex-combatants that perpetrated during the war and, ex and, and the people that are perpetrating sexual violence in the post-conflict period as well. Um, so this is not the right PowerPoint, but that's okay. We will skip ahead to this last point, um, which is about male backlash. This is the third area of research that I'm engaging in. Uh, we've also heard a little bit about this today, um, you know, about the importance of working with not just women, but also men. Here in the United States, we've seen a proliferation, or what seems to be a proliferation. It's, it's very possible that it's not, but that it's just coming to our um, acknowledgement now of men's rights groups. And this thing called the red pill or the manosphere culture um, which is an online culture of misogyny. And the Southern Poverty Law Center actually has a list of these kinds of groups, and they have a list of 12 organizations. In my research, I've uncovered 142 organizations um, uh, that uh, you know, profess this kind of misogynistic rhetoric online, it's whether through online forums, chat rooms, et cetera, some kind of organization exists um, that kind of is trying to proliferate this kind of a, a voice. And so the question here is, one, what are the connections with other kinds of groups that um, tend to use violence? And secondly, this is not a phenomenon that's unique to the US. Right? We've actually seen this kind of backlash and this organizing in other countries as well. I can give you examples in Liberia. I can give you examples in Peru. Peru was just trying to pass um, a very transformative gender law two years ago. And the, you saw, actually, men organizing and forming anti 
women's groups basically to lobby against this kind of legislation. And so this is not unique to the US. I just wanted to mention this here um, because, you know, um, we tend to look outward and not necessarily inward. And so um, those are the three areas. I, there's, there's so much research that needs to be done on this topic. Um, so I look forward to hearing what my colleagues have to say. Thank you. All right, let's see if I can do this. Did I get it? How do I get it to kind of go up there? Okay, wonderful. Now, Leslie, I want you to cough twice when I have two minutes left. Okay. <laughs> I have way too many slides, so I'm going to zip through them. Um, I'm here to report on a book project. Um, our next book um, is called The First Political Order, Sex, Governance, and Security. When I say we, I mean myself and two co-authors, Donnelly Bowen and Perpetua Lynn Nielsen. Um, I want to point out that this book is the project of the Minerva Initiative of the U.S. Department of Defense. So we were given three years of funding. We asked for an extension year, over a million dollars. Our Defense Department has invested in scholars who are going to be, uh, who proposed to look at the linkage between the security of women and the security of the states in which they reside. And you can imagine that this expanded our capabilities greatly. Now, because I know that I am speaking to um, a, an audience that has educated themselves on these issues, I'm not going to give you what I call the 101 talk. And in that 101 talk, I would march through the literature and show you how societies that subordinate women are insecure on a variety of dimensions that we would consider central to national security. So food insecurity, malnutrition, demographic issues, either too high a fertility rate or sub-replacement fertility rates, poor governance, the very type of governance is influenced by how women are treated within the society, the effectiveness of that government, as well as levels of corruption. I would look at the relationships in the literature between the situation of women and increased conflict, both inter-nation conflict as well as intra or within-nation conflict. We would look at the linkages to health and we would look how uh, in countries where women are subordinated there's far worse morbidity and mortality and inf infectious disease rates. We would also look at economic performance. The World Bank has done a series of pioneering studies showing a tight linkage between what's going on with women and how prosperous your economy is. But I'm not giving you that talk. So <laughs> what I would like to suggest is that there's something deeper going on. All right, and what we call it in the book is the first political order. And we assert that the first political order is the sexual political order. That is the character of male-female relations within a society will mold the society, its governance, and its behavior. I tell my students, think about uh, this as if you would a video game. Let's suppose we're in a video game design class. And as you know, when, when people start out designing a game, you know, they're given parameters and they're told to work with those parameters. And I said, here's your parameter. There are two groups, neither of which currently can reproduce without the other. And the future literally depends upon their interaction. Okay? And then they start asking me questions that are deeply political. Let's talk about those. All right. In the context of the difference between these two groups, will these two groups engage each other as equals or as subordinates and superordinates? And you can imagine that there would be a spectrum. We might find some societies that encode the difference between male and female as a difference between a superior and an inferior. And then we could array societies all the way along to the other end of the spectrum. We might find societies where the difference between male and female is not seen as an excuse for one being inferior or one being superior. 
Think about a second political question that my students would ask me. Okay, what about decision making, right? Given the differences between these two groups, will decisions in the society be made by one group or by both groups? And again, we could array societies along the spectrum, right? From less equal to more equal. How about a third question that's deeply political? Conflict resolution in the context of difference. If these two groups disagree, how's that disagreement going to be resolved? Can one group be coerced to provide what's required for group survival and persistence against their will? And here I couldn't help but notice when Razia gave that stunning little example of how when they gave toys out to children in Afghanistan shortly after the war, the boys would take not only the toy they were given, but they would take the toy from the girl. And if she resisted, they would slap her and take it anyway. Okay? And then fourthly, resource distribution in the context of difference. With regard to resources necessary for survival and persistence, such as food, land, weapons, children, wealth, will one group control these or will control be shared? Now, you can imagine that the type of society you would have if your answers were further to this side it's going to be vastly different than the type of society you would have if you're towards the other end of the spectrum. So consider a couple of research findings. At the macro level of analysis, and I've participated in this kind of research, consider that studies have shown that women's situation is significantly linked to a nation's propensity to be involved in interstate and intrastate conflict, the propensity to use violence first in such a conflict, the propensity to break treaty obligations and flout international norms. And then at the micro level of research, we have studies that show, um, for example, recent survey research has uh, been published just this summer showing that in a cross-nation survey, individuals holding highly gender unequal beliefs are also significantly more hostile to other nations, but also to minority groups within their own country. Well, where did they get that? All right, that first template, right, of those four differences that we talked about, schools a country, schools a population, right, in how to think about the other. Do you think about that other as a partner with whom you should coexist in respect and cooperation? Or do you think about them as an inferior who needs to be dominated, who needs to be coerced? So there is, I think, a linkage between how we're thinking about women within a society and how we will think about all others. Now, how does it manifest itself in international affairs? That was all highfalutin political philosophy type stuff. But how would you actually link this to what's going on in world affairs? And our group asserts that one way of doing this is by suggesting that there are two primary ways of ensuring a group security in the 21st century. One you know well, it's called states. The other you also know well, but you don't think about it in international relations. And that is what we would call extended kin networks that are based on patrilineal and fraternal ties. And we assert that where states are weak or weakening, patrilineality will resurge as a security mechanism because it enables men to cooperate tightly with one another. Think about what happened when the government in Somalia broke down. Every man to his tent and his tribe. And right now, the government is ruled, if you will, by those tribes and clan networks. South Sudan descending into chaos as the government becomes completely ineffective. What does everyone do to ensure their security? Every man to his tent and to his tribe. The clans and the tribes again have become predominant as the, the state as a security provision mechanism has faltered. But, okay, and here's the big but, when you choose those extended male kin networks as your primary group security mechanism, I think I'm speaking jargon here, but I think you're following me, you may get security in the short term. You destroy your security in the long term. What we find is these societies, uh, the, the, the extended male kin group approach 
to society aggravates insecurity and instability, produces high levels of corruption, government ineffectiveness, asset stripping, extremism, and the constant threat of annihilative violence. So how would you see whether nations in the world were more or less dependent upon these kin systems. It's easy to see in Somalia and South Sudan, but we argue that these extended kin network foundation for society exists in other countries as well, even in some democracies. For example, it's almost impossible to understand Philippine politics unless you understand the politics of clans and kin networks there and other countries as well. Well, we say, look at the situation of women. So what we told the Defense Department and what we did was that we looked at an interrelated complex of 11 variables. I'm putting this up here so that you can see that they're linked, but um, my next slide, I will list them for you because you can't read them from way back there, can you? So we looked at level of violence against women because remember that first template of conflict resolution, is it coercion? Right? Is that which you have been schooled to use against women within your household? Looking at women's property and inheritance rights related to resource distribution. Right? Have we chosen that one of those two groups, males, will have access to assets and women will not? We look at prevalence of patrilocal marriage where brides go and live with their husband's clan or, or tribal group. We look at son preference and sex ratio alteration. We look at the age of marriage for girls, because if you want to keep girls under your thumb, you got to marry them early, all right? And this is often seen in those societies. We look at the degree of inequity in family law and personal status law. We look at the presence of bride price and dowry. We look at polygyny. We look at the societal sanction of femicide, where women may be killed and male perpetrators may get virtually no judicial sanction for that. We look at cousin marriage and we look also at countries that have a legal exemption for rapists who offer to marry their victims. Okay, so this is an interesting syndrome of how you control male-female relations in order to prioritize male interests. All right, now you really can't understand this, but that inner black circle is that same circle of those 11 components. And what we've done here is we've begun to hypothesize, so how is this linked to food insecurity? So how is this linked to health consequences for the nation? How is it linked to conflict? We've begun to draw all the many linkages between that syndrome of female subordination and the outcomes that you get for nation states. Let me give you a couple of examples. Sometimes the linkages that we see are immediate and proximate. So this summer we published an article in the top-ranked security journal that looked at bride prices as a factor aggravating uh, terrorism and rebellion by easing the recruitment of young men into such groups. Uh, we've discovered bride price acts as a regressive universal flat tax on the subpopulation of young men. Bride price, like real estate in Sydney, Australia, or any place else, tends to inexorably rise. It tends to bubble, and the rise can be very dramatic. Surging bride prices are linked also to um, an increase in polygyny, where rich men who have the ability to buy brides buy many, and young men who are not rich may be left without brides at all. So what develops is a deep sense of grievance among these young men, and rebel groups that offer to solve this problem find recruiting really easily. Well, you may say, Professor Hudson, I mean, how prevalent can this be? Well, if you look at the societies where bride price or dowry is prevalent, you're actually looking at the countries in which about 75% of the population of the world lives. So this is actually a major and important problem. So just to give you a brief example, Boko Haram in northern Nigeria. Big, big jump in bride prices in northern Nigeria in the early 2000s. Boko Haram begins to use this as a recruiting strategy. The wives are abducted. As girls are abducted, they become wives. And what's not often reported in the press is that a token bride price will be left on the ground as these girls are kidnapped and the group leaves the village. One young lady said, in this crisis, these men can take a wife at no extra charge. Explain Kak, a young woman orphan captured and raped by Boko Haram. Usually it's very expensive to take a wife, very hard to get married, but not now. 
And in our article, we look at other cases. We look at South Sudan and we look at Pakistan um, as well. So this is one example of how these in this syndrome of subordination of women can really affect security. What we found in actually looking at the societies, what we did is we did a simple dichotomy. Does the society have prevalent bride price or not? And then we took the, the uh, Global Peace Index and we chopped it into quartiles from the, the uh, most peaceful to the least peaceful. What we found in that um, pretty back-of-the-cuff uh, um, cross-tabulation was that no society with bride price fell in the most peaceful quartile. No society without bride price fell in the least peaceful quartile. This is astoundingly significant, right? But it's something we don't see unless you put on your glasses that allow you to see the women, peace, and security angle. There are longer term types of linkages as well. Consider the masculinization of populations in nations such as China and India. The male female uh, global sex ratio should be 98 men per 100 women. It's now 101.4 men per 100 women. And no natural disaster or plague called this. This is entirely man-made. In 1990, when I first started studying this problem, there were five, count them, five countries that had abnormal birth sex ratios. Now, in 2017, 17 or uh, 27 years later, there are 19. We think things must get better as time goes on. This is a case where they have gotten worse. There are 19 nations now with seriously abnormal birth sex ratios, and they are not all in Asia anymore. Albania, Armenia, Azerbaijan, China, Egypt, Fiji, Georgia, India, Kosovo, Kuwait, Lebanon, Montenegro, the Philippines, South Sudan, Sudan, Taiwan, Macedonia, Vanuatu, and Vietnam. Okay. So it's also true that a lot of our big migrant flows are also highly masculinized. So the, um, the migration into Europe in 2015 was overwhelmingly male. And so some interesting uh, issues with, with sex ratios have cropped up there. If you look at Sweden that had an open door policy in uh, 2015 and also told immigrants that if they were younger than 18, they would never be deported no matter what, uh, a huge influx of young men claiming to be 16 or 17 came into the country. And the Swedes did not do any medical checks to determine what age they probably actually were. Now, the Swedes have totally changed this now, just so you know. They got smarter. But Sweden now has a worse sex ratio among its 16 and 17-year-olds than China has. The sex ratio among 16 and 17-year-olds in Sweden is now 123 men for 100 women. In China, for the same age group, it's 117 men for 100 women. So Sweden itself, what we might here in the US consider a bastion of gender equality, is facing these issues also. What kind of ramifications do you get from a masculinized sex ratio? Well, uh, these you can find these all over in the historical record and in the current contemporary record as well. Crime rates and political protest rates skyrocket. Marriage market obstruction said, uh, signs begin to appear, such as surging bride prices as brides become more scarce. Crimes against women skyrocket as well, including trafficking and forced prostitution. As a result, the mobility for women begins to get restricted as women fear uh, to uh, leave the home and uh, travel about. Infectious diseases such as HIV and other STDs are spread uh, much more quickly. There may even be an altered calculus of deterrence due to altered perceptions of the costs of attrition warfare. The Chinese government recently announced that it believes that by mid-century it will have 50 million more young adult men than young adult women. 50 million more. Consider that type of figure. It's really amazing to think how that may affect international affairs. Is a trend becoming visible? I think there are places where this old ancient security provision mechanism of male kin is resurging. I look at some of the Arab uprising countries. How can you explain Libya without uh, talking about the resurgence of this kind of syndrome? I think one of the reasons that even we here in the United States need to worry, as some of our other panelists and Ambassador Russell has pointed out, is when these things regress, they regress swiftly. 
right? And the reservoirs that I see for it to resurge are high levels against violence, of violence against women worldwide, um, both in times of war and, as Professor Kareem pointed out, in times of peace as well, right? That first big component, levels of violence against women, is still there, still a reservoir. And then secondly, we still have many nations that have inequitable family and personal status laws favoring males, whether we talk about property rights, rights in marriage, or even women as legal minors. Let me give you an example. People's Republic of China, communist country that enshrines equality between the sexes within its constitution. And yet, if you look at the transference, the inheritance of land from generation to generation, uh, uh, Canadian scholar, scholar Laurel Bosson did an incredible study that showed that land is still handed down to male relatives 97% of the time. So no matter what we say law is on the books, it's law on the ground, right? What's really happening that matters. So. We have an amazing amount of data that we collected, over 13,000 new data points. Um, I thought I saw Professor Nielsen here from the Bush School has done some field work in Sierra Leone. And we have some preliminary data analysis. We're actually crunching the numbers uh, as we speak. My next meeting with my co-authors is next week. We'll look at some more. Um, here is what the syndrome looks like in terms of spatial representation. And you can see that uh, the nations that subordinate women uh, the most in terms of our 11 variables are found in that belt. They are Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the Middle East, West Asia, uh, South Asia. But there are also countries where women still are quite vulnerable in terms of subordination. China itself, as we've talked about, but also areas of Latin America. So in our regression modeling, uh, our, we, we did a first couple of clusters. <laughs> and we found that this syndrome was strongly, significantly associated with many measures of demographic insecurity, such as high fertility, youth bulge, high dependency ratio, demographic pressure, teen fertility, low mean age at first childbearing for women. And uh, the second model that we ran looked at measures of economic insecurity. And we found, again, that the subordination of women was strongly and significantly associated with measures of economic decline, lack of economic competitiveness, et cetera, et cetera. Let's put it that way. We are also looking at a wide variety of other clusters, rontierism, governance, health, conflict, environment, education, social progress, and stability. So stay tuned. Hopefully the book will be out at the end of next year. So to sum up, given the many dimensions along which women's insecurity ties in with state insecurity, let's say it pretty darn baldly. Women's insecurity undermines state security. And I think Hillary Clinton may have said it best when she was Secretary of State, where, when she opined the subjugation of women is a threat to the common security of our world and the national security of our country. Women aren't the canary in the coal mine. Sometimes people say, oh, Professor Hudson, what's going on with women is just a consequence of things like lack of democracy or resource scarcity or poverty. Uh, I've been researching this for 25 years, and I can tell you that women aren't the canary. The character of male-female relations in the society is the coal mine. And the noxious fumes from that coal mine make the canaries of poverty, malnutrition, ill health, explosive violence, extremism, those are your canaries. All right, so final slide. Tracking this syndrome dynamic is critical to identifying the societal stressors that deepen grievance and lead to instability and conflict. Disrupting this syndrome, that is empowering women, may be key then to enhancing stability, resilience, and security. If you want to know more, feel free to go to our website, womanstats.org. We have the largest database on the status of women available in the world. Thank you very much. I doubt I'll need two coughs, but just in case, let me know. Um, I don't have nearly as robust a presentation as Mallory just uh, gave us, which was wonderful. Thank you. 
So my research is on women in the military. Um, and there was a question earlier about why aren't we looking at uh, internally? Well, I am looking internally, right. specifically about participation of women in the U.S. military. Um, and my, the title of my research is Women's Integration into Ground Combat Units in, in the U.S. Army. In 2013, former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta directed the services to remove a longstanding policy that, prohib that formally prohibited service women from serving in direct ground combat occupations and units. The combat exclusion policy was often seen as a barrier to gender, gender equality within the U.S. military. Removing the policy has been described as a step toward uh, breaking the brass ceiling and creating a more inclusive and equal institution. Conversely, opponents of integrating women continue to express concern about the potential for women to force a watering down of physical standards or to negatively impact unit dynamics and ultimately combat effectiveness. In July of 2016, the first uh, service women started integrating or started training to be infantry and armor officers in the U.S. Army. This first cohort included 28 women infantry officers and 20 ar women armor officers. After nearly a year of training, they were assigned to one of two brigade combat teams at either the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg or the 1st Cavalry Division right here in Texas at Fort Hood. In 2016, actually it was October of 2016, um, after these women had just started their initial entry training, I and my little research team, which included my sister, who as my videographer um, and a research student, we traveled to Fort Benning uh, with my co-investigator, uh, who's Dr. Me Megan McKenzie, and we traveled to Fort Benning where these women were being trained. We invited them to a breakfast, and, th and lo and behold, 30 of them showed up. We proposed our research project to them, which was to conduct a five-year longitudinal study that would follow them during their initial military obligation. And surprised, we were quite happily surprised, but they were totally on board. Um, and, but because of the time constraints, we only had a weekend, we went down on a Friday, we had to leave on a Monday, we were only able to um, begin the research with 22 of those uh, infantry and armor officers. Uh, we started that weekend with uh, uh, hour-long videotaped um, interviews with each of the women from the infantry and armor. The purpose of our research, as we explained it to him and it to them, and it remains, is threefold. It's one to document the experiences of the women as they integrate ground combat units. Two to capture and disseminate best practices and lessons for integrating additional ground combat units, and three to evaluate the impact that women have on uh, ground combat units. So, for goal one, we're looking to understand things like why do women choose to enter combat roles? And how can these motivations be acknowledged for recruiting and retention purposes? What are their experiences? And how are they being personally impacted? For goal three, we're looking at what can be learned from these women in terms of lessons learned for integration and best practices as the military continues to expand unit integration and as other militaries open up uh, these types of jobs to women in their countries. Do the experiences of this first cohort of women differ from subsequent cohorts of women? For example, does in integration become more streamlined and easier for women in any way as time passes? And for goal three, which is how do women impact units, we're looking at um, how do they impact the culture of these highly masculinized organizations? Is there an impact on as their numbers increase? And what, at what point might there be an impact? Is there such a thing as a tipping point where there, a critical mass occurs and, and there begins to ch be a change in the institution? So I just actually traveled here from Fayetteville, North Carolina, Fort Bragg um, on Saturday, where I had, we had finished our second, this is the second year of interviews. Um, and, and we're still processing it, so we don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of findings at this point, but my, our initial observations are, well, there's, there's quite a few initial observations, but we haven't systematically analyzed the data yet in any kind of um, me uh, methodological way because we've now only got two years. We've got the first year interviews, and now we've got the second year interviews. But now this year, they are actually out in their units, either at Fort Hood or at the 82nd. Um, and just cursory observation is that, um, I guess, 
it's hard, it's actually kind of this has been a really painful project for me frankly because it's rather shocking the change over a year between their mental and physical changes in one year the physical changes in many of the women have been surprising last year the women were smaller less muscular they had long hair and were generally excited by this opportunity and that's very superficial um, they were almost bubbly with excitement and anticipation. They recognized where their, their place in history. Um, they, they felt that they had a high sense of um, the historical significance and, and kind of felt a, a lot of weight to prove that women could handle these occupations and jobs. Um, this year, they, look, they are visibly different. Mo few of them have hair <laughs> because most of them have been through ranger school. Only a few of them have graduated. They are much bigger, muscularly bigger, tattooed in many cases. Um, they, they have adopted their behavior and their appearance to try to fit into these organizations. The, their excitement is, I would say, gone and has been replaced with a sort of jaded disillusionment by the, their one year of training experience. Uh, Megan and I are, are been calling it kind of this an, an impossible double bind that they're in right now. They're doing everything they can to prove that they belong in an organization that everything is defined by masculinity and, and being a man and they're women. And it's impossible to be that which you can never be. Um, but they're trying very hard to assume and uh, the, the roles and the technical abilities um, that they're expected to have to be able to fit into these organizations. Um, some of them recognize this double bind, but others are convinced that they can overcome it. And many, many of them are experiencing harassment, marginalization, and like I said earlier, there's a, there's a great deal of disillusionment. Uh, we, one of the questions that we ask them is, do you anticipate staying in the Army for a career or even beyond your initial obligation? And I think only two out of the 22 at this point have said that they plan to, uh, an actual career in the Army because they're so um, discouraged by their experiences so far. So the, it's two, we're two years in, we've got a five-year project. I think that maybe their attitudes will ch may change as things adjust, um, as they adjust. Uh, I, I certainly hope that it's not a, a permanently kind of damaging experience for them. Although I will say that some of them are, have been, will tell you that physically, and we ask them, what's been the impact? And physically, many of them, especially those who've spent four, five, six months at ranger school trying to become army rangers will tell you that they are physically, um, have been injured and uh, m many of them have had surgeries just in the first year. Um, broken wrists, uh, torn ligaments, that type of uh, thing. Now that's not to say that the, the, the men that they're serving with similarly have injuries like that. It's common in this kind of training. So. That is a, kind of a progress point for the women who are integrating the ground combat units. And maybe next year I'll tell you what year three looks like. Thank you. So I have the unique role of being the last speaker on the last panel of the day. So for efficiency, I'm going to address you all from my seat here. But um, I appreciate you all indulging me to talk a little bit about the work we're doing at the George W. Bush Institute in support of First Ladies and the really neat research study we released um, this year that uh, aims to change the narrative a bit, not only on the role and influence of First Ladies, but um, adding to the very limited field of research on um, the value of women as leaders. Um, at the Bush Institute, like all of you, we believe that women are catalysts for positive change. And when used effectively, a First Lady's podium can steward change. Uh, so through our First Lady's initiative, we aim to support First Ladies globally in using the unique platform they have to improve lives uh, through efforts aimed at education, healthcare, economic opportunity, gender rights, but working with them to continue to move the needle forward. And we do that through four uh, very specific ways. The first being building a robust network of global advocates working to advance these issues. Uh, today is a fantastic representation of that. We recognize with principals uh, being a former president and first lady that we have a unique ability to bring folks together. And so we strive to do that. Uh, the program itself was born in 2013 um, uh, as part of our uh, Africa First Lady Summit in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And we've continued to do that in, in very large and small capacities since that time. We also recognize 
that there are huge expectations placed on First Ladies, and they often have few staff and few resources to execute their vision. And so we recognize the value in, in building capacity and sharing be best practices. Um, we've hosted advisor trainings. Uh, we currently have a project uh, where we're working very closely with the First Lady of Namibia, uh, Madame Monica Gangos, um, uh, and working with her and her staff on her vision uh, to empower young people and to bridge uh, the poverty uh, divide that exists in Namibia. Um, on that note, we also aim to foster sustainable public-private partnerships. We've heard quite a bit today about the value of collaboration. Um, it's something we strongly believe in at the Bush Institute. You see it across all our areas of engagement and quite prominently on our, on our women's initiative work. So again, bringing stakeholders to the table and really taking steps forward to move dialogue into action. Uh, and then the last area that we work in, um, we really stumbled upon. Um, when we were looking for, for resources and research, we recognized that there's virtually no analysis on global first ladies. Um, it, it doesn't exist. And so uh, we decided, being the Bush Institute, we had a unique opportunity to bridge that gap. Um, and so over the course of the last two years, I have had the incredible privilege of interviewing uh, current and former First Ladies from across the globe, uh, historians, advocates, other stakeholders who worked with First Ladies or who have been committed to similar causes with First Ladies to really understand what this role is about and what can be done um, to support them and to continue to encourage collaboration um, that, that shows sustainable progress. Um, and so this year in March, we, we released that report. Um, it's entitled A Role Without a Rulebook. And I think one of the most interesting things about it is that it gave us some perspective on, on the role. And um, interestingly, the role itself in many countries lacks a formal description. Um, there is no job description. There is no instruction manual. And, and largely, both in the United States and globally, the role has been defined by the individual in the position, the environment in which they find themselves, and the changing role of women more broadly in society. Um, and in looking at that, we identified a four-part typology. Um, hostess, teammate, champion, and policy advocate. And what was really interesting about that is it's not a linear trajectory. Um, it's, it's not a progression. You, you do see a little bit of that in the historical context, but again, looking at, at the individual in the position, first ladies themselves often define the role based on what they want to achieve, what they're most comfortable in doing. And so when you look at the role of hostess, and I think most people think of it in, in terms of um, social functions and sadly designer labels and, and what they're wearing, we overlook some really important functions like soft power. Looking back to Martha Washington, who really set a standard and a precedent for First Ladies in this country, um, she used to invite uh, the spouses um, of, of key leaders within the U.S. government, as well as um, uh, leaders themselves for salon dinners. And it was, it was an opportunity, yes, to socialize, but it also fostered dialogue that was really critical to the progress of our new nation. Um, and most people don't realize that. Uh, a recent example that you can see in the hostess role that was really quite vital, and I think a lot of people overlooked, um, on the recent Asia trip of uh, President and Mrs. Trump, Kim Jong-suk of uh, South Korea, the First Lady, she's a culinary wizard, and sh her gift to our President and First Lady was hand-picked persimmons that she dried, stuffed with walnuts, and hand-dipped in chocolate. And obviously, right now, the relationship with South Korea is really important, and that gesture that she demonstrated really showed respect um, and uh, a, a commitment to the relationship that they were aiming to build. And these things often get overlooked because we're more concerned on you know, the menu of state dinners and, and what people are wearing. Um, the teammate role, um, I've become quite obsessed with Clementine Churchill recently. Um, mm -hmm. I think what a lot of people don't realize about her um, is that there would be no Winston Churchill in the way we know him without Clementine. She advised him on his speeches. She wrote some of his speeches. Um, she was a critical force and she knew uh, they had a very strong relationship, and she knew um, early on in their marriage that you know she never had to worry about his wandering eye with other women, but that her biggest competition would be his devotion to politics, and that if she wanted to continue um, a close relationship or, with her husband, she needed to get wise to politics. And so she served almost as a chief of staff, um, and that's something that, that, that people don't recognize. In the champion role, we have examples like 
Mrs. Laura Bush and her continued advocacy um, for Afghanistan. In the policy advocate role, something that a lot of people overlook is, and, and you look in her continued commitment on Burma is that she was the first pers first first lady to give a press address uh, from the White House press briefing room. And it was very rooted in policy and, and people overlook that. And so through this research, it was fantastic to be able to tell those stories and to look at that typology. Um, in this study, we also found that uh, there are common challenges that women face. Again, this is a rule without a rule book. There is no instruction manual. Um, women write the position for themselves. Um, there's a legitimacy <coughs> gap that exists. So how do you lead when you are unelected but official and have immense expectations placed upon yourself? And then as we've seen across every topic I think that's been discussed today, uh, there are gender stereotypes that persist. Um, so last panel of the day, I know you're all cold and you've all been sitting here, but I want to <laughs> take a little poll, especially as we're the research panel. <laughs> How many of you can name Angela Merkel's husband? Mm. How many of you <coughs> knew that she was even married? Okay. <laughs> we treat men and women differently in, in the role. Um, her husband is a scientist. Uh, you look at Theresa May's husband, who works in finance. And they are permitted to live their lives, to continue to go to work, and to be who they are. Uh, Angela Merkel's husband, uh, Joaquin Sauer, wasn't even present for her inauguration. <laughs> he watched on TV and he's been very committed to his wife's success, but again, imagine if Brigitte Macron or Melania Trump or Rula Ghani were not present for their husband's inauguration, the media <laughs> would have a field day. Um, it was fantastic, the British press wrote a fantastic, uh, satire piece, I believe it was in the Times or the Telegraph, and the first time that Philip May stepped outside 10 Downing Street, and they commented on his sexy pinstripe suit, and the fact he chose Oxford, not Brogues, and it's just fascinating, because we, in a very um, unfortunate way, um, hold women to different accounts in this position, and so despite these common challenges, not surprisingly, women continue to lead, and they lead because of common leadership attributes. Um, things like personal proficiency and recognizing how they can use their skills and backgrounds. Um, in the work we do, Mrs. Bush often tells uh, Global First Lady, start with what you know, your interests and your passions, because that's what's going to continue moving you forward when you face some of the most difficult um, barriers to, to success you hope to, to see. Um, things like strategic vision, and this is something that I, I think is really, really interesting. Um, with First Ladies, um, and, and many of them have recognized how they can serve as a voice for the voiceless um, and can really break down barriers. Looking to women like Lula Ghani, you know, she recognizes her role um, is to advocate, to facilitate, to amplify the, the grassroots advocates who've been working for so long on behalf of progress in Afghanistan. Um, I look at, at Monica Gengos in Namibia, and she believes strongly that her role is an apolitical conduit that she can build a bridge between civil society and government institutions <coughs> to create change. And if you think about it, there really are very few prominent influencers who have that capacity. They're not necessarily designed, uh, defined exclusively by politics or exclusively as a private citizen, but they bridge that divide. Um, and so through our work, we're consistently seeing how women um, lead and how they leverage this position. And, and through our work, supporting them and being able to do that. Um, and I think what's also quite interesting that people don't recognize about First Ladies is the fact that their leadership journey does not start and end in the role. Many of them were well accomplished before they became First Ladies, and many of them continue to do incredible things afterwards. You see it in philanthropy, for example, Cherie Blair and her foundation and what she's doing to empower women entrepreneurs. You see it in politics. Many of us know Secretary Clinton is a, a great example of that but the Vice President of the Dominican Republic, Margarita Cedeno de Fernandez, who was interviewed for our report, is the current Vice President. <coughs> Margarita Zavala of Mexico is running for the presidency. Julia Pu of Uruguay served as a senator. There are multiple examples where they have pursued higher office and ele or elected office. And then also in business. And you hear less of this, but you know, looking in the UK, for example, uh, Samantha Cameron has continued her, her um, success and, and her personal interest in fashion and has launched her own fashion brand. And so these stories are really important to tell. Um, and, and I think, again, going back to the role of First Ladies and being able to, to bridge divides is really important when we look at um, women, peace, and security. 
particularly in instances where breaking down stigma is really important and bringing stakeholders together to have a dialogue, especially across political offices, um, other demographics that often um, prevent uh, productive uh, movement on issues that really are critical to everyone's prosperity and well-being. Um, I could talk about this all day, so I'm going to stop there because I, I know we can have a really interesting dialogue among all of the <coughs> different research we represented. That was terrific. Well, I also think this is just a really great way to end the day because every single panel has been super fascinating and it's really interesting to see how diverse all of your research interests are. And so we're going to open up the floor for some questions, but while you're all thinking, I have a million questions, so I'm going to squeeze in one before you all um, get a chance, but uh, when we get the microphones out, we can start looking for whoever wants to go. I'm really interested, what motivated you, each of you, to get into the particular direction you're going in your research? So I can, um, sure. I can start with um, the topic about post-conflict sexual violence, um, because I actually kind of fell into this topic. It's not actually something that I ever intended to study just because of um, kind of the, the, the trauma that it can be associated with, with studying it. Um, but uh, it, it occurred because uh, I have a fantastic research assistant that runs everything for me on the ground in Liberia. And I happened to be there on the second day of, a, of one of my visits. And she had to, she got a call from somebody in her community. Um, and she took it and she had to leave. And basically what had happened was that there had been a case of a two-year-old girl who had been raped. And so she, um, she went and I went with her because I was with her. And I saw the two-year-old girl on a, lying on a dirty mattress. She couldn't walk. She couldn't go to the bathroom. Um, she wasn't eating. And that, that was it. I was like, I, <laughs> I, have to, I have to study this topic. I have to try to understand why this is still happening. Um, and so that has led me to getting a series of grants from the Swedish government to be able to do this research um, to try to understand why we're seeing um, this, this actually, um, it is a problem of uh, sexual violence among minors, which is, uh, you know, we don't know what the rates are for adults, but we know that the rate for, for minors because of these health clinic reports are very high. Uh, you know, I've, I've thought a lot about how I ended up um, doing kind of this line of research because I went through graduate school uh, in um, the 80s during the Cold War. And you could have taken every single class in my graduate program and not even known there were women on the planet Earth. So it was a complete womanless world in terms of the world of national security. And I'd kind of, you know, imbibed that. But I think, um, just to be really brief here, I think there were three things that kind of woke me up. And um, one, was I spent several years, I couldn't believe this, I spent several years as a wheeled vehicle and power generator mechanic in the 11th Special Forces. And again, this was back in the 80s. This was well before any sort of PC, you know, let's get women into, you know, what. And saw things there that would curl your hair. And that's why I have to use straightener on my hair because it's <laughs> permanently curled. Um, and then um, I think the second thing was I had a daughter. And as you, as, once you have a daughter, I mean, I know you don't have a daughter yet, but <laughs> once you have a daughter and, and you read stories about a two-year-old girl being raped, you crawl under a blanket and cry yeah. Yeah. until you can't cry anymore. And you are determined that that will not be the world that your girl walks in. And then I think the third thing was that there were women who pre preceded me. It was the first wave of feminist scholars in IR, uh, Ann Tickner, Cynthia Enlow, mm -hmm. Spike Peterson, Christine <coughs> Sylvester, who had begun saying, wait just a minute here, that's not reality, which you've described in your IR theories. That's the way a man would mm -hmm. look at these things. That is not the way a woman would look at these things. So all of that kind of fermented inside of me, and I think my first foray was actually looking at 
uh, abnormal sex ratios and, and what the upshot for national security would be um, of that. So that's what got me started. How about you, Ellen? Well, I think it's a common reframe, which is something personal, um, of course. Um, I was in the ar Army for 30 years. I went to West Point, went among the first classes to integrate um, the service academies. So it was similar personal experience. And then two years before I retired, um, I actually sued the Secretary of Defense over the combat exclusion policy because I was like, enough. We need to stop this segregating of women and, and, and putting women in positions or not allowing women to, to attain the positions that are considered the most uh, valued within the military. And Thank so, you. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, yeah, I mean, eight months after we filed our lawsuit, Secretary Panetta lifted the policy, and I've just kind of felt committed to this, this group of women that I know. Um, it, it's just very personal to me, just like mm -hmm. you all. So two factors that, that had an influence. First and foremost, my mom is an incredible individual. She herself worked a lot. She's a medical practitioner, worked a lot on um, sexual assault, sexual assault forensics. So I've always had an interest in women's empowerment. Um, and um, I know there's quite a few students here. And after grad school, I had the opportunity to intern at the White House. Um, and I worked in the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, and it was at the very end of the administration. But I always had had such an appreciation for the leadership of President and Mrs. Bush. Um, and, and what they have done, particularly in relation to development, PEPFAR, um, and their commitment to collaboration. Um, and so that really stuck with me and, and worked in other roles on, on, on women's issues. And then as the Institute was building out um, its programming um, and the First Ladies Initiative came to be, um, I can't say that I ever thought I would work on First Ladies. I did a project in sixth grade on Jackie Kennedy Onassis. <laughs> um, but the program itself had a strong focus on Sub-Saharan Africa. And so for me, that was important. And I was really intrigued because in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, first ladies are often seen as the mothers of their country. And there are so many of them that are doing incredible work in, and working with local stakeholders in ways that, that really are pushing, pushing needles forward on a variety of issues. And so that piqued my interest. And then as we started digging into the work and needing to find resources and realizing there weren't any, um, that really opened up uh, uh, a gap, or identified a gap for us, and as a presidential uh, institute, you know, we're in a unique, we have a, a former first lady um, who demonstrates the value of this role, and so what's been fascinating is how supportive other first spouses have been about the work that we're doing, and this research I'm so proud of because I think it sets a strong foundation for us. Um, in the work that we're doing through the FLI, but also to add to that and to add to the gap that also exists <coughs> on the value of women as leaders. Um, so that's really how you know we, we entered into the space, and I don't think this report is sort of our last entry into scholarly study on the topic. That's great. Anyone from the audience with a question? Well, so one of the ways that I got actually connected with them to be able to even do this research was we did establish a support group for them. Um, and it was through that support group that I m was able to, um, well, to, to invite them to the initial breakfast. Um, so yes, we have a, a monitoring and a support group. My organization is monitoring, but the support group is, um, there's a couple of senior women that, that are leading it uh, by senior. Um, we've got one general officer. Uh, several of us are retired um, colonels. Um, and, and then we've also tried to set up a, a support group for the enlisted women. So this isn't just the women officers. We've now got enlisted women who are also. The, it's been harder to support the enlisted women simply because they, they're more dispersed, there's more of them, and they're, they're less trusting, frankly, I think, um, and less inclined to join the support group. So yes, we do, is the answer. Another question? Similarly, some other countries in India, uh, but, uh, but the question is, it's a fact. How do we turn it around? Oh, well, there, there are many ways to try to turn these things around. Uh, in fact, uh, 
I just had uh, a paper published earlier this year that looked at South Korea. South Korea, as you know, in the 90s had a very abnormal uh, birth sex ratio. It was approximately 116. It was just awful. Uh, and now, about 20, 25 years later, their birth sex ratio is normal. So I think there's ways to do it, but to be perfectly honest with you, what you have to do is to go back to that 11 variable syndrome that I talked about, and you've got to begin to dismantle it. So that's exactly what South Korea did. It began to dismantle right, this interlocking structure that, in a sense, kept women imprisoned and subordinated. Uh, so for, they had to dismantle, in effect, uh, the clan network. They had to give women rights to be heads of households within clans. They had to give women the right to not be erased from their family's clan upon marriage. They had to give women inheritance rights on a par with men. There was a whole group of things that they had to dismantle in order to begin to turn this uh, around. So there's things that can be done. India's doing some things. China's doing some things. So we can, we can certainly talk about that. Oh, there's your microphone right there. <laughs> yeah, so uh, regarding how to achieve these numbers or to, you know, how if, if there's a uh, bad sex ratio you see and you get to a better sex ratio, and you talked about these uh, behavioral or uh, more very fine scale or when you break it down to male-female interactions in household level or in society, social scales or in work, atmosphere anywhere, how do, how do you ensure that these numbers, when you achieve these numbers, you actually are correcting those behavioral norms? Uh, or do you always see that transformation too? Oh, well, I think you, I mean, if you've lived in the United States long enough, you know that we don't have an abnormal sex ratio and we still have major problems with male-female yes. relations. But it is very nice to be allowed to be born, all right? So I would say, in that sense, that societies that have moved beyond abnormal birth sex ratios are societies that value women more. Because to see two X chromosomes as the worst possible congenital birth defect that one could have, deserving of culling from the population entirely, I mean, uh, that's, that says something right there. So do we have things that we have to work on here in the United Well, you bet. I mean, this incredible Harvey Weinstein movement that we're having right now has opened a floodgate where women are saying, it was me too. I, I, this not only happened to me, but I had to swallow it in a sense, right? Not say anything about it, not do anything about it in order to keep my position, in order to, to, to keep my career, and so forth. And I think we're seeing um, a, a really watershed moment in our history where we're saying it's, it's not funny. That Al Franken photo is not funny. Louis C.K., one of the most celebrated comedians in the United States, you're not funny. Kevin Spacey, you deserve to be rubbed out of a motion picture. I mean, there's, my gosh, there's accountability. There's career accountability now for men. And so I think every society has its own particular uh, battles that it's fighting on male-female relations. Uh, and so just because you have a normal sex ratio doesn't mean your battles are over. But it means that one really important battle has been won. Yes. 